um, before I start diving into the uh, research uh, to tell you a little bit more about myself, although you told a good amount already. Um, but yeah, so here, as you can tell from my accent, I am from the United States. Um, and actually on this day, 30 years ago, I was born uh, in the middle of the United States in Oklahoma um, to parents that came from uh, Vietnam after the war. And then after that, eventually we moved to the East Coast to New Jersey uh, to some suburban town where Oreos were invented. Um, so very, very boring uh, and I got tired of it. So then I decided to take out um, to, to take out a student loan and, and, and study at NYU, a very expensive undergraduate college. Um, but there I was uh, introduced to soft matter research by doing um, basically research in the Center for Soft Matter Research, which I think many people in the Dubai Institute know of. Um, and after that, I decided to go to grad school and I went to grad school in Philadelphia uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's there that I came to learn to, to love liquid crystals. Um, and that's where um, I, I pursued this uh, research topic that I'm going to dive into later today, uh, later on in the talk. And then I then moved back to New York City to pursue my postdoc and to study nanoparticle assemblies within liquid crystals funded by the Simons Foundation. Um, and as you can see also here, I didn't really move very far and that's because uh, I actually don't know how to drive. Many people at Utrecht have already asked me, um, do, you, do you miss driving? That's like a very typical American thing. And the truth is, uh, I don't know how. <laughs> and so now here I am at Utrecht, very happy to be here and part of the Dubai Institute. And I still think I, I still don't need to drive in order to get around here. And so we'll see how far uh, I can get away with not knowing how to do that. <laughs> um, okay. And so now back to the research, that was a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I, I grew to love liquid crystals during my graduate studies. Um, and as you can see, part of the reason is because liquid crystals can be very beautiful, both the data and the uh, theories that you use to describe it. And so the model system that I'm going to be working towards is this uh, shell configuration where you have a liquid crystal that's confined within a shell. And this is done with the use of microfluidics, where here this is a sort of schematic of the type of device that you would build in order to shear the liquid crystal and have it drop off and be confined within the shell. Um, and so the idea here, which I will work towards by the end of this talk, uh, you'll see how I use this model system to assemble nanoparticles within specific configurations. Um, and so the video that you were seeing before and also within this video, um, surrounding this shell is water. Um, and if you change the chemical environment, in this case by introducing some soap, a soapy molecule, which will interact with the liquid crystal, that will cause it to change uh, structures. And so you can see here different patterns that are being formed because of the different chemical environment. Um, that it's experiencing. And then you also see here that the drops are slowly beginning to grow in size. That's because the shells are becoming thinner. Um, and as they thin, the patterns that are being formed are also changing in time. And so you can see the shell configuration is very nice in order to achieve this. Um, and so the goal here is to use the nice geometrical confinement, the, the sort of dynamic changing in geometry to reconfigure nanoparticles that are incorporated into the system. Um, and so we'll work towards that, but not immediately. Um, I'll go through an introduction. I'll describe briefly what liquid crystals are, what nanoparticles are, uh, and then I'll also explain how we use geometry, geometrical frustration in order to control the structures that are formed within liquid crystals. Um, and then I'll talk about how these structures are controlled experimentally uh, before then incorporating particles and patterning them um, both on, on simple droplets and then on this model shell configuration. OK. So introduction. Um, but before I dive into that, since I know that this is a broad audience, I also kind of want to frame where liquid crystals sit within the broader field of soft matter. Um, so what is soft matter? 
uh, here's Pierre de Gen. He's a Nobel Prize winner, um, and he's often called the founding father of soft matter. He stated that Americans like to describe soft matter um, using more the phrase complex fluids, uh, which he didn't like because it could be intimidating to students, but it, it captures uh, some essences of soft matter, which is first that it is complex, meaning that it's made up of composites, right? There's collective phenomena, uh, but also that it's a fluid. Um, and with the collective phenomena, usually small changes in the system can have large scale consequences. OK, um, and so some examples of soft matter, soft matter can be seen uh, throughout our everyday lives. Um, here are some uh, constituent parts where here there's this uh, surfactant. This is just like a, a soap, right? There's an oil loving tail and a water loving head. You can have a special surfactant which has two oil loving tails. This is called a lipid um, and they can uh, collectively interact to form say a micelle or in this case a liposome, um, which is actually just a simple version of a cell membrane. And so within us, there are uh, their soft matter. Uh, polymers, uh, DNA, that's also soft matter, bacteria, biofilms. Um, here's a, a fun video. People normally say that it's so boring, it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> but if you actually look at paint drying under the microscope, it's actually very fascinating. Um, it's a suspension of colloids, right? And so you can see here the structure um, that it's forming as, as the drying process is continuing. So it's actually not boring, and it's also soft matter is in materials that we uh, interact with every day, um, including liquid crystal displays, the very displays through which we're interacting with each other right now. Um, that's also another form of soft matter. And so a very important theme in soft matter is also self-assembly, that there are these con constituent parts that uh, interact with one another. Um, and indeed, all of these uh, examples that I mentioned now, they're actually also able of forming a liquid crystal phase. And so liquid crystals, it's a phase of matter that also falls within this larger umbrella of soft matter. Um, and so one recent push that a lot of researchers are, are moving towards is applying liquid crystal physics to biological systems. In this case, uh, you have an epithelial skin cell, a, a skin tissue, um, and from looking at the ordering of the tissues from the liquid crystal-like structures that they create, they can actually control uh, from the structures the where certain cells will be extruded, um, and which is part of the normal regulation of, of the tissue. OK, and so liquid crystal physics is now also being applied to broader systems. And so now what are liquid crystals? Um, here is a cross polarized microscope. That's sort of the workhorse in a lot of liquid crystal studies. Um, and the images that you can see when you look at a liquid crystal uh, under the microscope can look something like this, where first liquid crystals are composed of rod like molecules. Um, if they're disordered, uh, and you're looking at it under cross polarizers, it'll just appear black. Um, and that's because there's no changing of the direction of the light, so there's no transmission. Um, but now if you have the molecules starting to point in the same direction, uh, forming a pneumatic liquid crystal, right? The, the index of refraction along the long axis is different compared to the short axis. So now you see some light being transmitted, okay? Uh, and then you additionally see some points here. These are structures uh, within the liquid crystal that are called defects. Um, in this case, for the pneumatic, these are defects where the direction in which the molecule is pointing is not well defined. And so uh, you'll, you'll see also that the types of structures that you get change when you get more complex liquid crystals. For instance, if you have a cholesteric liquid crystal, in this case, not only do the molecules want to point in the same directions as their neighbors, but they also want to twist uh, stacking with each other uh, in a helical fashion. And so now under the microscope, you start to see these uh, beautiful stripe patterns um, and the stripe emerges because of this additional twist that needs to occur. Um, we can also consider how uh, the, the structures that we get from a cholesteric liquid crystal will be more complex compared to the pneumatic um, because now you need to consider different things that need to be ordered. For the pneumatic, you're just worrying about the direction in which the molecules are pointing. This is also called the director. Um, but in a cholesteric, you also have to worry about the direction in which the molecules are twisting, which is the pitch. Um, and since you have these two that are perpendicular to each other, you also have this cross product. Um, 
But basically, in a cholesteric, you're organizing a triad of vectors, while in a nematic, you're only organizing one vector. And so the types of structures that you get are more complex. OK, um, cholesterics are also seen throughout biology, right? Um, you, you may have heard that in biology, there's a lot of materials that are chiral. Um, so here, if you have uh, here, we have a, and for example, we have this beetle shell. Um, if you look at this beetle shell under the microscope, you start to see uh, many of these uh, polygonal domains, right? Um, but if you use a stronger microscope, such as an atomic force microscope to see more detail, um, you actually see that each of these domains are filled in with this uh, spiral-like structure. And these uh, spiral-like structures act as micromirrors that allow for the beetle shell to have structural color that's also very reflective and uh, metallic looking. And so indeed, these spirals that we're seeing here in this picture are signatures of cholesteric leukocrystals, crystals. Um, and they're also seen, um, for example, here in this synthetic cholesteric liquid crystal, OK? And so it's also seen throughout biological systems. And one thing to note is that the structures that are within biology are rarely equilibrium structures. And so we have to also consider uh, dynamics and kinetics in our systems if we're interested in mimicking biology. And so why do we see stripes, though, with the cholesteric liquid crystal? Um, it's because of an energetic frustration. Here we have a schematic of a cholesteric liquid crystal where it's twisting in the horizontal direction. And so this is the direction of twisting. If you put the cholesteric liquid crystal against some surface that's forcing the molecules to be perpendicular to that surface, you can see there's a frustration here. You can't twist in space while also being perpendicular everywhere um, on this surface. And so there has to be some sort of compromise, right? And so often the compromise is reached by violating this uh, anchoring condition. Um, and it's done periodically because the twisting is happening periodically. And so the stripes that you're seeing are actually stripes of orientation of the molecules from perpendicular to parallel and so on. OK, and so that's why we see stripes. And so if we want to control the structures that we see, though, um, there, there's also an open question of exactly how anchoring works um, in, in the submicron scale where geometry and chemistry are both equally important. Um, the, it's not really so well understood how anchoring works for small molecule liquid crystals. And so by introducing nanoparticles, this is another way of kind of probing that fundamental question. OK. And so if we want to control these structures, uh, we also want to think about the geometry in which we have the system confined. Uh, for instance, here we have a sphere. So if we have a sphere and we have ordering on the sphere, then that may be one way of making sure that you have structures that need to be there. For instance, if you think about a globe, there's lines of longitude and latitude on the globe. Um, and because they're on a globe, though, they're necessarily mathematically has to be uh, defects. So two uh, poles where the north and south pole are defects in lines of longitude and latitude. Um, and since liquid crystals are also ordered materials, if you can find those within the sphere, they have to also follow the same rules. So then necessarily there has to be defects as well. Um, we use a shell geometry instead of just a simple sphere because now you have adjustable thickness. Um, if you're able to tune the thickness of your system, then you're also able to tune the, the bulk energies, uh, the, the amount of bulk energy compared to the amount of the surface energy, which then also controls the, the types of structures that you get within your system. OK. And so now if you take uh, the liquid crystal, the cholesteric liquid crystal, and try to fit it within the shell, where you're fitting it uh, with uh, different ways in which the molecules can be aligned on the surface. Um, if they have to be parallel to the surface, then the cholesteric liquid crystal can fit in like this. And then when it fits in like this, it can uh, basically just fill the entire shell, and you'll get these point defects similar to the, the north and south pole on the globe. OK? Um, if you have very strong anchoring, as I said before, you can't twist. And so then you undo the cholesteric liquid crystal and you don't get any structure uh, defect structures within the shell. Um, but now if you have uh, a twisting cholesteric liquid crystal that only very weakly is perpendicular at the interface, um, now you get stripes. But exactly how are these stripes ordered? This is sort of the area in which we could explore. Um, 
Before turning to experiments, I want to show you some simple simulation results um, where we did just this. Um, there's This is a shell of a cholesteric liquid crystal uh, that's simulated where we had weak anchoring on the inside and outside of the shell, weak uh, perpendicular anchoring. Um, and so here this is color coded so that the direction of the molecules, if they're perpendicular to the surface, it's in red. And if they're parallel to the surface, then it's in blue. Um, so now you're seeing that the cholesteric liquid crystal is twisting across the surface. Um, and actually in our simulations, we don't see any defects in the direction which the molecules are pointing. Instead, the defects are, are in the stripes. And so here you can see that there are these spiral patterns that are forming um, and the direction which the molecule is twisting is not well defined as you can see from this cross section of this blue area here. Um, and so you'll see a lot of these double spiral patterns. These are actually defects within a cholesteric liquid crystal that are unique to a cholesteric, okay? And so that's the, the introduction to liquid crystals. Um, you could see that if you have a cholesteric liquid crystal, uh, combine it with spherical confinement, you can get structures like this, um, which are these uh, defects in the cholesteric, okay? And so now experimentally, how do we control these structures? And so how I do it experimentally is by introducing a surfactant, like I said before, a soapy molecule that has an oil-loving tail and a water-loving head. When it sticks in, the oil-loving tail will want to interact with the liquid crystal molecule and have the liquid crystal be parallel to the tail and thus perpendicular to the surface. If you um, now label the surfactant with a fluorescent molecule, you actually start to see structures like this, where here the any intensity that you're seeing is showing you, it's only coming from where the surfactant is located on the surface. And so what's interesting is that you see, indeed, as you increase the concentration of the surfactant, you see that the stripes are becoming more disordered as the frustration is increasing until at some point there's no more stripes seen at, at the surface uh, because now the surfactants are saturating the surface. And so it's perpendicular everywhere. Um, but what's especially interesting about this data set is that not only is it is the surfactant changing the anchoring, but the liquid crystal is also patterning the surfactant at the surface. And so you have this uh, kind of cross communication of the bulk and the surface, uh, and, and it's creating a sort of adaptive anchoring condition. Um, and so what's, uh, this is a nice way of, of obtaining a chemically heterogeneous surface as well. Um, and so another thing I want to note is that the liquid crystal still wants to twist, even though it's being frustrated here and is pointing perpendicular everywhere here. Um, but because it can't twist so easily, it's actually twisting really rapidly uh, away from the surface in the bulk, and it's creating these long defect lines. Um, and so what these defect lines look like, if you look under a normal bright field microscope, is something like this, where we're looking at it within a shell, the, the, the model shell geometry um, that I mentioned before. And so these thin lines are little twist defects in the cholesteric liquid crystal that are far away from the surface. Um, and this is a video. So in this video, I'm going to remove the surfactant so that now the liquid crystal will be allowed to twist at the surface and you can see uh, different patterns emerging. And so as the surfactant is being removed, you see here the stripe thickness is decreasing. Stripe thickness, again, is related to the orientation of the molecules at the surface. There's some instability that occurs until all of the stripes are removed. And so we're moving right from this strong anchoring regime to this uh, weak perpendicular anchoring regime to this now planar anchoring um, where the molecules are parallel to the surface. Okay, and so I'll let that video play one more time. You can see that the stripe changing also doesn't happen. Uh, the thickness isn't changing linearly because the surfactant isn't being removed linearly. Um, there's some instability until you get at the end, no more stripes. Um, you, you do see this little dot and this little dot is sort of like the north or south pole uh, that I described earlier, okay? And so by changing the surfactant concentration, you, you can obtain a wide array of different patterns. Um, and here again, you see these sort of spiral patterns that you saw also within the beetle shell. And again, each of these spirals are defects um, that are special to a cholesteric liquid crystal. Um, and so what's interesting about these spiral patterns is that they actually are not flat at the surface. Uh, if you take, if you polymerize it and then do an AFM height profile, depending on how strongly your liquid crystal is twisting, you can actually see um, that it can create a, a, a bump at the surface. 
And so we took the shell, we polymerized it and looked at it under an electron microscope. Uh, and this is what we saw. Indeed, the surface is corrugated and it's corrugated according to where the spirals are located um, in, in the system. And so when you uh, try to measure also the high profile, because we're, we're here having a polymerized system that we dehydrated to view it under the uh, SEM, we actually see height differences up to a micron. And so this is uh, a, another interesting way to obtain sort of uh, particles that are of unique shapes, right? Where if you consider the shell to be a single uh, particle. Um, and so this is also, since you can see here, surface tension needs to be defeated, right? In order to, to deform it away from some flat surface, um, you can actually tune the, the amount of surface energy compared to the bulk energy by tuning the geometry of the shell. Where here, uh, if you have, the, uh, the shell be very thin at the top and very thick at the bottom. The surface energy is the same everywhere, uh, but the amount of bulk energy will be less at the top and more at the bottom. Um, and so if you look at the system actually at the top where it's very thin, you don't get any of these spiral patterns because you're not able to deform and, and defeat surface tension in order to create a hill to accommodate the spiral. And it's only at the bottom where you have a proliferation of these spirals because now the liquid crystal elastic energy can overcome the surface tension. Okay, and so geometry can be used to tune also the structures that you obtain in your system. And so here uh, I showed you that if we uh, use different experimental techniques uh, like combining the, the surfactant concentration with the geometry of your system, you can obtain uh, different sets of, 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 of patterns within the cholesteric liquid crystal. And so now we're going to introduce uh, particles to it. And so this is a uh, highlighting uh, work that I uh, published in Science Advances. And so this is just on simple droplets. And so the idea here is that now, instead of using surfactants, we're gonna use nanoparticle surfactants, uh, where the nanoparticles are functionalized, they're, surround, they're suspended within the water, um, they're functionalized so that they want to wet the liquid crystal. Um, and the interactions will be different because now the nanoparticles can interact with each other in, in more rigid ways. They're able to kinetically arrest with one another. Um, and, and basically, they, they don't have the fluidity that, that surfactant system, that regular molecular surfactant systems have. Um, and so how we form this, uh, we're looking at these just on droplets. Um, if you just uh, shake a solution that has liquid crystal nanoparticles suspended in water, um, then they will break up into droplets that have uh, nanoparticles adhered to the surface of, of the liquid crystal. Um, but before I go into that, I wanna talk about the relevance of this to technology. Um, so you know, liquid crystals uh, are elastic, dielectric materials, they're reconfigurable and responsive, which is, uh, they're all properties that are needed in order to make a pixel within a liquid crystal display. Um, but people now are trying to develop liquid crystals to, to uh, be incorporated into biosensing, where here the structure that you see within the droplet is changing uh, because it's interacting with some endotoxin that's present in the surrounding. People are also using them as sort of temperature sensors, where here these are uh, sensors that patients would, could be able to wear uh, to read out uh, different uh, temperatures. And then nanoparticles are also important for technology because they have very interesting uh, optical and electronic properties, right? So they can be plasmonic or they can form structures that are also photonic, where you get here structural color um, because of the way in which the particles are organizing. And so it would be very interesting. Many researchers now are looking into combining liquid crystals and nanoparticles for sort of next generation uh, technological applications. Um, and so here are the, the results uh, for if you're taking a, a vial, right, with the nanoparticles and then you're shaking it up to get the nanoparticles to adhere to your liquid crystal. Um, if you have it so that the nanoparticle uh, is not functionalized very well, um, these are all confocal micrographs, first of all, where any intensity that you see is because there's a nanoparticle present there. And so in this case, uh, the nanoparticles are not functionalized enough to want to adhere onto the liquid crystal, so they're not going on um, and they're not being patterned. But if you increase the, uh, the, the tail coverage on the nanoparticle surface, now you start to see some of the familiar patterns that we saw before, 
Um, these patterns are, are a bit disordered, though, because the assemblies are, are more rigid, so they're not perfectly conforming to the liquid crystal. If you uh, functionalize the particle too much, uh, then now it's just going to crash onto the surface. As you can see here, uh, it's forming a very thick crust on the particle surface, and it's not reflecting any of the liquid crystal ordering that's happening underneath. Um, but now if you reach this uh, sort of sweet spot where the concentration of the surfactant is such that you can get uh, a slight double layer of the surfactant forming at the surface, now the, the particles are interacting with each other so that they're more flexible, and then you get a more perfect ordering of the particles at, at the droplet surface, okay? Um, but then if you complete this bilayer, then again, they're not going to attach to the surface. And so it's sort of working within the sweet spot that then you can use the liquid crystal, uh, change it very slightly to see if you can pattern the nanoparticles um, and into more specific configurations. Okay, and so working within this regime, uh, you can vary the, the stripe patterns that you get by also th the same way that you did it with the surfactant lipid system that I showed you before, you can vary the concentration of the surfactant very slightly. Um, and then here you can change the, you can see that the stripe width is changing with the increase in concentration of the surfactant. Um, but now you can also change the way in which the, the particles are being patterned by also changing the liquid crystal. Um, if you make it so that now the liquid crystal is twisting more, then you can also change the stripe thicknesses this way, where here you're actually able to obtain uh, at a certain concentration uh, stripes that are of a submicron thickness. And so this is interesting because it's at the wavelength of light, and here you're able to play, or play around and see if you can get a uh, structural color out of the, the particle assemblies at, at the surface here, okay? Um, and so now I showed you the, the results. If you have particles that are uh, functionalized with surfactants, you can, in a specific uh, regime with a specific chemistry, have the particles be patterned by the liquid crystal. Um, but now, uh, how do you combine this with this shell geometry, where you're able to change the geometry dynamically um, so that you can have a bit more control uh, over the, the way in which the particles are, are conforming themselves onto the liquid crystal surface. Um, and so this uh, next paper that I will be discussing, the, the next set of results um, was published recent this year uh, in, in ACS Nano. And so now, uh, if you introduce a polymer into the system, in this case, a, a, a polymer that's called polyvinyl alcohol, um, the, the polymer backbone interacts with the tail of the surfactant, um, which then mediates the, the nanoparticle interactions with each other. You actually get a very large window of patterned uh, particle configurations. And so this allows you to then also stabilize the shell geometry and change the shell geometry with time. Um, if you uh, change the, the inside so that now the system wants to swell and so that the shell is growing in time, making the shell very thin, you see here that the patterns that are being, uh, the patterns here and how the nanoparticles are reflecting them are changing also in time. And so now you're getting sort of dynamic reconfiguration of the nanoparticles uh, at the surface of your system. And you're able to control it by also tuning how much the, the shell is, is thinning out in time as well. And so here, what's uh, especially interesting is that if you have swelling of, the, of your shell system with the particles adhered onto it, the way in which they're ordering at the system is, is very different. So now the, the highest density of the particles is along these twist defect lines that I explained to you before, uh, when, when otherwise they were behaving like surfactants and following anchoring. And so somehow changing the, the uh, system in time is also changing the way in which they're ordering fundamentally. Um, and so if you look at the rearrangements over time here, you can uh, map out the pixel intensity, which is telling you where particles are located um, on, on your shell. Watch it, watch and see how it changes in time. Um, at first, they were located all along these uh, stripes, um, but as the system is evolving and as the structures in the liquid crystal are changing, you can see that the particles are being pushed because now you have uh, this peak at, at t equals zero is now being split into two. 
And so the particles are being pushed to, to the sides of the stripes until at the end, uh, where particles were initially depleted is actually where the particles have the highest density now. Um, and so they're changing uh, what structures that they're conforming to as well. And so this is uh, especially interesting because now they're able to follow uh, the structures in the colosteric liquid crystal. They're able to follow the defects um, and, and stabilize them. And so if you have the system without any particles and you just let it equilibrate, you actually won't get any structure at the end because you are not letting the liquid crystal uh, twist within the system um, when the shell gets too thin. But now if you're having this process done in the presence of particles, then you're actually able to get these structures uh, that are, are stable and they won't go away. And so these defects are now kept there because of the presence of the particles um, and they they stay there basically indefinitely because now the 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 dynamics of the particles uh, adhering on and the system changing uh, its geometry over time is, is creating these defects and causing the particles to arrest the structure. Um, and so if you reduce the outer particle concentration, you, you can actually freeze in uh, structures that are interesting uh, in the cholesteric liquid crystal where here you can see that this type of structuring is different compared to the lines. And even this uh, small structure here, this is a, a double twisted structure, which uh, many people that are interested in, in cholesteric liquid crystal structures fundamentally, uh, this is one way of stabilizing them and freezing them in. And so the, the basic idea is that you're uh, having the particles, you're, you're swelling the system, uh, causing the particles to kinetically arrest, and dynamically you can get them to freeze in these structures uh, out of equilibrium, okay? And that's because of uh, a coordination of different effects, of, of different dynamics within the system. Um, and so to, to end, I want to discuss briefly future directions that I would like to take uh, now that I'm here and part of the Dubai. Uh, I, I am interested in uh, looking at how particle geometry and chemistry uh, interact with one another in order to better probe what's happening at the submicron scale. Um, and I'm actually recruiting, uh, looking for a postdoc who may be interested in pr pursuing this project. Um, so if you are, please send me an email. Um, but the idea here is that by, by changing the geometry of the particle and the chemistry of the particle and studying the resulting assemblies, you'll be able to better know what's happening at the submicron scale. Um, another project that I'm pursuing is uh, looking at the ordering of the, where in this case you're using bio-derived nanoparticles such as cellulose nanocrystals taken from, from leaves. Um, you, you take these uh, nanoparticles, they, they assemble and form a cholesteric liquid crystal um, because the nanoparticles themselves are chiral. And so here the, the particles are forming a cholesteric liquid crystal phase. Um, how can we then control the structures that are formed by this uh, particle uh, colloidal liquid crystal. Um, and the idea is that if you wanted to obtain structural color, like what you see in biology, you need to also be able to form many of these defect structures, which are of course out of equilibrium, um, and look into ways in which you can assemble particles and assemble structures and freeze them in out of equilibrium, but in a controlled way. Um, and lastly, uh, I guess, 10, five to 10 years from now, the direction in which I'm interested in going is just looking at liquid crystal ordering and confinement in, in biological materials and seeing how liquid crystal structures can inform the, the function of biological materials. Where here, uh, for example, you can have microtubules that are forming different structures or also amyloid fibrils. Uh, these are the, the protein uh, aggregates that um, they, they, they condense, for instance, to form plaques that, that are the cause of Alzheimer's. Um, but if you take them and you purify them and have them condensed, then they also form a cholesteric liquid crystal. Um, and so seeing how the, the cholesteric properties of the amyloids compared to uh, what you get in situ would be sort of interesting to, to see what that relationship is. Um, and so to conclude, uh, I'd like to just leave up these uh, conclusions uh, from, from the works that I highlighted today. I want to thank my, my sponsors and, of course, all of my collaborators and you for your attention. Thank you very much.